The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. How are you? Oh, great. I cannot wait for everybody to listen to our guest today. Will you tell us a little bit about Sherry? Oh my gosh. I'm so excited that we have Sherry on, first of all, because Dr. Sherry, her name is Dr. Sherry Parks. She was introduced to us through our dear friend, Dr. Anjan Chatterjee from UPenn Center for Neuroaesthetics. So he spoke so highly. I know we all love Dr. Anjan. He spoke so highly of her and actually introduced her through a video and a panel that he sat on with her. And it was just such a, how do I put the words here? Like it was such a beautifully done panel, but really thought provoking. And I just had to reach out to you and Katrina and say, we must have her on the show. I'm so glad you did. Yeah. She's incredible. So not only like, did she come to you through on John, but she's an incredible scholar, researcher, writer, community organizer. We learned that she was on public radio for 20 years. 20 years. Um, I know it's fascinating. Yeah. And so coming to us most recently from the Maryland Institute College of Art, also known as MICA, and I think she's a professor of American studies at the University yes. of Maryland, too. Yeah. Amazing her, background. Well, and that's the whole thing. Like her background is so compelling and just kind of weaves this really interesting path of how her work focuses on how art and aesthetics affect our day to day lives. And how aesthetics can actually be used for a tool for social justice, which I don't think we often think about. But when she spoke mm-hmm. about this, it was like, of course, and almost like an aha moment of like, yeah, how are we not using this as a tool? Yeah, you'll learn about how she's the program director of this really cool thing called the Natural Dye Initiative, mm-hmm. which is sort of a multifaceted project, explores cultural economic impact of dye, especially indigo that really was in the mid-Atlantic and the Southeast regions, and then now it's being reintroduced back by Black farmers and markets. Amazing mm-hmm. to listen to. You have to, have to have to listen. It's super fun. And I know, Jen, you know, some people may be thinking like the first 15 to our minutes, you're going to hear a lot of background. You might be wondering like, how does this relate to biophilia? But we promise you, <laughs> it's very, it's very so clear. Does. So if you're interested in how nature, history, culture, and art all collide, keep on listening. Sherry, we are so thrilled that you're with us today. Thank you for joining us. We have a mutual friend within Dr. Anjan Chatterjee, and he highly recommended you. And we're such a big fan of his work and who he is. And he's such a thought leader. So thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And I join your fan club. Anjan <laughs> is, is an amazing researcher and an amazing human being. Well, we're glad that he recommended you and spoke about you. And ever since we uh, heard about you and your work, we definitely want to have you on immediately. So we appreciate you taking the time. So with that being said, we always ask people to tell us a little about your background and how you got into learning about and wanting to study aesthetics. I went to undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill as honors creative writing major. We had to take the because it was a BFA, we had to take all of the English major classes, and I was in Shakespeare class having I was playing, 
And, and <laughs> the professor asked me to stay after one day and he asked me if I was thinking about graduate school because I got his Shakespeare jokes and you know I found the dark eyed woman and you know, all of that stuff. And I asked a very undergraduate question. I said, help me to understand what this has to do with being African-American in the 20th century. And this, and I won't say his name because I don't intend to embarrass him, but this internationally known Shakespearean said, what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I love it. I like Neither it. Neither of us were sophisticated enough to answer the question. So I went that day and added radio, TV, motion picture as a second major because nobody had to help me understand that electronic media had something to do with the everyday lives of Black people. And so I've kind of been on that train. I had already become yeah. a, a print journalist and went to get a master's to help me understand how much power I had because I had seen that exercise. And, you know, by the time you worry about the cultural implications of your story, somebody else has written it. So I stayed and got a PhD, wow. did a big quant master's thesis, but was nice. really interested in the nuances of how families moved around popular culture and aesthetics. And the way I teach this to undergrads is I say, follow the dog because cats are unreliable for this. Like, the dog knows where, the, <laughs> where this room is. And it's where people hang out, you know, it's where the room is often untidy. It's where the trophies and the family pictures are. It's usually where the best media is, but just sit there for two hours and wait and watch. And they think it's lame. And then until they sit there and because then they have to interview the family about what they observe, the patterns and the rituals and the meanings of everything in the room. Families won't let you take a picture of the room because, like I said, it's never tidy, but you can sketch it. And so that is kind of the simplified version uh, of my dissertation where I'm in the family's home for, for a very long time, not sleeping there, but just, you know, and then mapping all the things that they do. So two things I've always been interested I in. I've that. never felt I've had the luxury of studying something for studying sake. I'm the daughter of two public school teachers, which someone said it explains it all, right? But I'm also interested in meaning and aesthetics and everyday life. And I've always been, and I found different ways to study it at the individual level, the family level, at the community level, which is what I think you're most interested in. But in Fierce Angels, which is a book I wrote that's in two editions so far, where I trace the sacred dark feminine from the early creation stories to the present and argued that that strong Black woman image and function is the same thing. So that's obviously, and I found it on every continent. So obviously that's kind of the big picture. And I argue that it is a model of Black women's leadership models. And it's something that women, all women do, but Black women have been praised for it, whereas many women in other cultures have been taught not to do that. Interesting. Interesting. Ha ha ha, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I don't even know where to start because I want to know everything. <laughs> I love everything you're talking about. I'm fascinated. And I do want to get into the community stuff in a minute, but but I want to talk a little bit more about the dissertation and how that led you to where you are, because I think that's really interesting. I'm a huge believer that sort of everything is everything and everything we do from whatever, you know, the earrings I chose this morning to the mug you put your coffee in to the picture you put on the mantle, these are signifiers, right? And whether we recognize it or not, we are putting out something into the world. So tell me what you learned and or as you've worked with people and, you know, put people into those rooms and said, why do I have to sit here and watch these people for an hour? You know, what were some of the high level things that you learned there? Because I find just the dissertation fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, the superficial answer is that it led me to the edges of mass communication research because it, it immediately started bringing in my dissertation advisor who was a theory father for family systems theory. And the method I used has the first clinical use that's used in family therapy for families with schizophrenia. I don't teach it. It's that powerful that you have to keep a family therapist on call when you do it because it, it works like a drill. And so I'm not even going to name it because I don't even teach it to graduate students. But one of the things that it helped, I'll tell you a story about a family that, that, that will be one of the highlights. So this was an African-American family, mother and daughter. They had moved from Boston to Amherst, Massachusetts, because it was a college town, better job, better education for both of them. 
and I had them fill out their daily routine. I did an inventory of their daily routine. And one of the things that they said was that they spend the evenings together. But then when I started walking them through it, they lived in a townhouse. The daughter would come home from school first, would get something to eat. She would preset the TV for her mother and presetting not only the channel, but the volume. Now she's Part of my human subjects review is that you will hear things that you've never heard before. So when they're like you said a minute ago, they're doing things, but they're not saying I'm going to do this because this is play. Mm -hmm. They just do it and don't interrogate themselves about it. So then she would go upstairs and start doing her homework because part of their family mythology is that education is really important. So it was important for her to be a very good student. And her mom was getting a master's too. The mother would come home. And she would come down for a minute and they would talk a bit and the daughter would go back upstairs. Now, notice they told me they spend the evenings together. Now, the mom would then get something to eat, then watch the TV show that came on at the time that her daughter knew she would. Long story short, they're listening to each other. The daughter often is doing homework to music, not really exciting music Uh. that she's studying at a certain volume, certain genre. The mother is watching TV. The daughter listens, and if the mom adds music, then she listens to what the music is. And if it's really sad music or particularly antic music and the mom's dancing, she comes down. Mother's doing the same thing. If the daughter is listening to music for that's sad, she'll listen to see if it's one or two, but if it got to three, she'd go upstairs. So they are together and apart. At the same time. And we do this a lot. I mean, when, again, I'm going to go back because it's easier to talk about my undergraduates. So when you were 13 and you are biologically in many ways an adult, but you're still, because of our society that's relatively affluent, you are emotionally and financially and in all ways really dependent on these people. But you get angry with them because, you know, you're 13 and you're hormonal. And You go to your room and then they pick up the narrative. If you're of a certain ethnic group, you slam the door. But black and Latino kids don't slam the door because then the parents will take it off the hinges. Uh, (laughs) You're creating a sound, right? Wow. And then most of them would say, then you turn on music. And I'm simply asking at this point, loud or soft? Oh, as loud as they'll tolerate. Genre, whatever makes them nuts. So what did you just say to them? that you cannot say in words. And, you know, we all know what they just said. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm being careful not to say the word, but we all know what it is. Yeah, and so yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah. it is play <laughs> and play is not serious for us, we can say and do all kinds of things that help us be a family. You can still be 13 and still get dinner that night, but you said something that made you feel better and annoy you know, them to pieces, right? I interviewed a father, a family where the father had an amazing sound system, but sometimes he went out to the car, didn't drive anywhere. He sat in the driveway and they said, but it's a Volvo. It has a great music system. And it took a while to dig out because I'm one of the parts is I'm having them talk about each other in others' presence. But he finally admitted that he did it just to get away from them sometimes. Notice he wasn't sitting in the driveway alone. He was alone, but he wasn't alone. Sure. And he was listening to the music because of all had such a great sound system. Wow. Yeah, so we, we do these kind of half truths all the time. And because it's play, we don't think about it. And you're right. It's very unconscious. I was talking to a colleague who is a pretty well-known French horn instrumentalist. And he said, does it have to be the the word is hearth room. I said, no, it can be anywhere the family gathers. And he said, we just redid our kitchen. And, you know, I had a hand in it and he showed me a picture and I said, oh, of course you have French horns in the carpet. He said, what do you mean? And I said, there's the bell there. He said, Sherry, I picked that carpet out. I'm a French horn player. I never saw. Wow. Oh my gosh. So now you're going to go home and look around your house and say, what are, I mean, and and all of this is a way, and this is really important because in some ways I'm a mythologist is that, and I don't mean myth as in fake story. I mean, myth 
as in meaning structures that are often aesthetically encased, but don't Mm -hmm. have to be. And so I asked my students, what are, and every family has them. This is who we are. This is how we locate ourselves in the universe. I told you I'm the daughter of two public school teachers. Family myth is we are smart and we are honest. Oh, yes. Okay. The way I have my students identify it, said, you bring home a lover. If they don't have these two or three things, your family works hard and either covertly or overtly to spit them out. Every family has some deal breakers. Sure. And it's not, you don't sit down with your children and say, this is who we are. And everything you do and everything you say, you are saying yeah. that. And so they, we make decisions every day that are so ingrained in us that we don't question them. We are in the middle of the summer and we're all wearing clothes where we would be more comfortable without them, physically more comfortable, but it didn't even cross our minds because this is what one does. And where did you learn that? I mean, you know, you if you have children, you you put clothes on them and you go outside, you do that okay. every day. Yeah. And they learn that this is, and that's how families work. And that's why families are so important as a social unit. It's not the lectures, it's what we are, it's what we do, it's how we move around each other. And yes, the things we have in our house that are really, really important. That's so interesting, Sherry. Just the idea, I'll just say, just the idea of like the witnessing that you're describing that we don't see or we overlook so often, but this witnessing of our family values or what we're taught or what we bring home to make it a special place for us or not, we do it unconsciously. And that's really, really fascinating. Were you blown away by what you studied and what you learned? Oh, I I, I was so excited. I I was just so excited. But it also can be hard because a family, that same family, the dad who's sitting out in the driveway, the mom was a librarian and she had put him through undergrad and grad school. And they said she didn't read, which I thought was a little Mm -hmm. odd that she was a librarian. And, you know, like most mothers, she read in the bathroom. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, she she in, where dress, the women are so short, right? Is that you need to, yeah, even before electronic media in the women's magazines, they were like a page, two pages long. This was my dissertation. I'm getting a PhD. He has a PhD. And he said, she doesn't read because she doesn't have a PhD. <gasps> and I'm recording this. There's a little camera right, here, right beside my head. And she swings <laughs> and looks at him and then looks at me. And that's, that's why you have a family therapist on uh, side. And later she thanked me. She said, I kind of had, so I didn't do any permanent harm to anybody, <laughs> but families are saying things out loud yeah. for the first time. Yeah. And she said, I kind of thought he would, he thought that, but I'd never heard him say Interesting. that. But it was hard at first, but we talked mm-hmm. it through and we're better now. So it's like, yay. But at first I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, like that, yeah, first do no harm, right? Yeah. Even though they had signed in and families who obviously had secrets that they didn't want me or each other to hear hadn't done it, they went in as kind of co-participants because halfway through I would say, this is what I think I'm seeing and let them. So, I mean, they were in, as empowered as they could be in that situation. But families have always fascinated yeah. me, including pseudo families. The pseudo family is a great transition to start talking about the work that you've been doing, the project that you worked on with students in Baltimore. These are kids in underserved communities. And you went to them and said, how do you envision, and and I don't know if these were your words, a utopian Baltimore. I have a little bit of an issue with the word utopia because I think we bandy it around and it's sort of maybe it could be a place that we're going but does it really exist? But maybe a better Baltimore, a Baltimore that you want. And so I I just want to set that, that when you spoke to these kids and artists, I think then represented, sketched out what these kids were talking about. Tell us about that process, because in a sense, you were creating a family unit, you know, a pseudo family unit with these kids to say, what would you want? Well, and you're right. I didn't use the word utopian. It's just kind of a shorthand. I, I, First, I asked them what they wanted to tear down. I should back up and say this was part of a much larger project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I have to, yeah. I have to say that. No, I interviewed great people called Baltimore Stories that grew out of the Baltimore Uprising of 2015 after the death of Freddie Gray and the custody of Baltimore police. I host what's called a thinkathon every year where people bring their ideas and their concerns and scholars and activists and thinkers and community leaders come together 
and we work on them. We workshop their ideas and you get to take your idea That's home. Cool. Wow. So this isn't, you know, the, yeah. somebody stealing your idea. You can, and, you know, we try to follow up and provide services. And so narrative kept coming up. We need to know one another's mm. stories. We do. And there was somebody from NEH there. And for years, I thought she lived in Baltimore. It turned out later she had come up to see what we were up to. And she invited us to apply for this. It was the first year of these public humanities grants. Long story short, we had 25 community partners. The major partners was UMBC, which is another higher ed. This is when I was at the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance was also a major partner. And so we staged 20 events around narrative. Wow. Yeah, nobody's a big deal. And it's, it's parts, yeah. parts of it have been copied. New York twice, Charlotte, Boston. And my favorite is an anthropologist in Colombia, South America, who used it with the FARC rebels as they were reintegrating Whoa. into the mainstream society. Wow. Right. So, okay. so this was just one of those 20 events. And so Barclay Elementary School is a school in Baltimore, almost all free meals so as a marker of, and we went in and we asked them first what they would want to tear mm -hmm. down. And I have with me not only a small team that worked with me, but two working artists out of MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art. And we explained to the kids that the artists would be sketching and taking notes and would go away and come back with some paintings. And I said, so first, what would you tear down? And they said, the liquor stores and the gun stores. Now, these these are upper elementary, you know, lower middle. Mm -hmm. And they just said that immediately. There was complete consensus on what you tear down. And one said, how many liquor stores does the community need, does the neighborhood need? Yeah. And they're right. And so I said, so what are you building in place? And kids at that age are not known for high levels of empathy. They're busy growing. And, and they said, there are people worse off than we are. Oh, my God. Wow. And you can see some of this in the video that your viewers will be able to see. It's only about six minutes. And then they began to build a homeless shelter, but it's the best homeless shelter in the world. It's got a community kitchen. It's got a barbershop. It's got a beauty parlor. It's really a community center that includes people who are home insecure. And they also built a, the council who was there said, well, what about for yourself? And so they built a bike park. But so funny about this and. And I like to feel that we had had some impact here because that's really important for our work, as I've described, that it have impact. They mentioned green space. They wanted green space. Wow. And they wanted they wanted a squirrel. And I think a about squirrel? it, a squirrel is brilliant <laughs> because in order to have a squirrel, you have to have, or in their minds, you have to yep. have a tree mm -hmm. and you have to have grass. And so the squirrel became the symbol of an entire ecosystem, uh, but they mentioned it so much. And you'll, you can see this in the video that both artists, when they come back, one is a dreamscape and it's got a huge squirrel <laughs> in it. You know, there's squirrels in all of their work. And so it was really funny. But what I learned there is that it matters so much when your work comes back in art. And they said, because they said both, and we didn't ask them, you know, the artists, what medium, you know, we didn't tell them. They both used oil. Oh. And mm. the kids said, this is real <gasps> art. You made our ideas oh. into real art. Wow. So I That's learned really something, That's really interesting. Right? Um, and the artists came prepared to change things. And the kids said, no, you listen to us. You oh. heard us. So the originals are still there at the community center, but we said we we're going to take good pictures of them and send them to the city planners who are really excited yeah. to get them. And I like to think that we had something to do with this because they said we, we go back and look I at bet. those pictures that now there is a plan for a bike park. Oh, wow. There have been other people who have been advocating, so it's not all me. But also right across from the street, there's a park. Oh, yeah. wow. That's incredible. Oh, that's got to feel so good. I have to laugh at the squirrel because <laughs> as does. a kid who grew up in like a, a, not a very nice suburb of, uh, outside of Los Angeles and then lived in San Francisco, like a city, right? Something about squirrels, like that signify, <laughs> signified nature to me as well. And it's what a funny thing, right? Like my husband yeah. thought I was nuts. Like I was like a squirrel. And he's like, <laughs> not a cow, not a horse, not a bison. I'm like, no, a squirrel. A squirrel means trees and 
But I don't know. I like that as a connect and connective. They're cute. They're cute and they're fluffy, unless you have to live around them, which I do. Yeah, they have really good PR. They have really good PR. They do. Yeah. Those animated <laughs> Disney shows are cute and getting. Um, oh my god, it's so true. So, That's funny. So I think all the squirrels in New York City. Yeah, that's enough. exactly right. <laughs> so I love that. And we'll definitely link to that video because it's wonderful. And I yeah, think yeah. that kind of work, and it's so much work, right? Like that should not be dismissed, like the time and effort to put on one event, let alone 20, and then bring people together and those artists and everything. So that's really exciting. And I want to mention, and because this is the part that is way too often overlooked, there is expertise there that you have to understand. I'm a cultural systems theorist. And so you have to understand how cultures work and how attitudes and behaviors work and how people move through them. Because notice I'm also moving between cultures. I'm moving between the community in Baltimore, mostly working class, Black, and people who have resources or power. And so if I have a superpower, it's that I can move back and forth that way and be trusted by both, Mm -hmm. which years, but it also takes a lot of, that's the ethnography yeah. right, of watching, watching people and understanding what's most important to them because every community of humans has lines that they will never cross. Mm. Yeah. And I'm curious, the artists that you use, did they look like the kids? One did. One did. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because that's, I think that's another way to bridge, but it really maybe didn't even matter what the artists looked like. The fact that the artists came back with the oil. That was so meaningful. Well, and I also asked for one of my criteria is that these were people who had to be comfortable in community. Not everybody yeah. is, right? And the white guy is working in Durham, North Carolina as a community artist. Nice. And the black guy is a working artist yeah. in Baltimore, but very invested in the community. So if they walked in and flinched or were anyway uncomfortable, this whole project yeah, would have been dead. Sure, sure. That's part of the aesthetics, right? Is the emotional right. energy people are putting off. Oh, working class people of any race can read you in about two seconds. They have to. Yeah, that's true. They have to. Tell us about how this led, or I don't know if it came out of Micah and the relationship with the artists, but the natural dye program, because it's incredible. Yeah. No, it's just incredible. Yeah. Thank you. No, really. uh, at the University of Maryland, where I was professor of, but also associate dean of arts and humanities and for research and interdisciplinary scholarship and programming. So because I was one of the professors that was doing this all on my own, and the deans kind of created a, a position for me to come in and help other faculty do this and did a lot of projects in College Park. But because I've always, almost always lived outside of Baltimore and did public radio in Baltimore and my family's life was in Baltimore, I became slowly the University of Maryland's Baltimore point okay. person. Wow. So if the researcher wanted to do something in Baltimore, the president's office would send you to me. And I used my resources because 20 years on public radio, I could cold call people. And there was more than a 50% chance that they wouldn't know what I looked like, but they knew what and I sounded name. like. Yeah. Sure. And so that's what I was doing. And Micah got... I said, you got tired of me playing in your backyard. And they said, yes. So they recruited me to come and do this same work. And always, and I hope you can hear this, I'm moving between deep research and theory and community usefulness. Sure. So at College Park, not everybody, nor would I ever put some faculty members in in the community. Just won't work. One said, you do know we're the nerds, right? Um, and you know, I, but I, I made a deal that I could run around them. So I would take their work out Perfect. into the community. You know, with I'm a good academic with of footnotes, course. you know, sure. credits. So that's what I was brought to Micah to do. Natural Dye Initiative was really jump-started by Yumi Hogan, first lady of our previous governor, who grew up in Korea. And grew up in Naja, Korea, oh. which is an indigo, has been historically an indigo capital. Natural indigo had almost died out because of synthetic indigo, but began to research at the same time that I'm telling you about. So about five years ago. So Baltimore is in the same latitude as Naja, Korea. So she wanted to know if it would grow. She's an alum of Micah oh, and a part time faculty. Okay. She brought it, brought it to Micah in 2018 where Micah put together 
a presentation for the Korean delegation. Wow. And right after that, I come to MICA. And part of it was to, to build it up. So I know I didn't start it, but I'm in there in step two. And we began to, the faculty as well, began to engage urban farmers in Baltimore. And we grew not only indigo, but other types of natural dye, but several different strains of indigo. It hybridized itself. So there's a Baltimore strain of indigo. Cool. We incubated a small dye kitchen, Blue Light Junction. Wow. We regranted some of our money, funding from first the Department of Commerce and a subsidiary. We've gotten money from both Maryland State Art Council, which is part of commerce. Our biggest funder right now is the Department of Housing and Community Development wow. State. Love it. So we've also gotten support from agriculture and increasingly now foundations who are asking to be part of the story. Yeah. So basically what we do is we engage. Let me back up because the story starts with Korea. But one of the things that we did, and this is important to me as a Black researcher, is that I said in majority Black city, we have to recognize that this was a slave crown. And that's one of the days when we use my black face and my PhD, you know, you wave it around. I mean, not to, you know, Howard County right outside of Baltimore has the largest population of Korean, second largest in the country. So we've never, never turned our backs on the Korean part. But in this country, and this is part of the debate now, as we record this, there's a national debate about whether slaves benefited from slavery because they learned skills. But this is a very important story yeah. that indigo was really important in the 18th century. And they tried to grow it in South Carolina, Georgia, and really? couldn't. So if you do a Google, you'll, Eliza Pinckney, you know, is credited with growing indigo. Well, she was the daughter of a planter. She was not in the back 40. Sure. We know that, mm -hmm. right? And so they kidnapped and enslaved West Africans who knew how to grow and process yeah. indigo. They were enslaved because of the skills they already, already had. had. Yeah, yes. thank you. So they brought to South Carolina because indigo is easy to grow if you know what you're doing. But if you give it the wrong amount of sun, if it doesn't like the location, it just sits there and looks at you. You know. It's, <laughs> um, so as you know, Black farmers have been losing their land because of literally at this point centuries of yep. discrimination. You can grow... 36,000 indigo plants on an acre. What? Wow. That's incredible. Um, and it likes to be crowded. Huh. It likes to be wow. hugged. <laughs> be hugged. Um, I love that. Yeah. And so it can make a big difference with a small yeah. farmer. Right now, indigo is undersourced and it's, it, the market is growing very rapidly. So because we're academics, we've done, you know, we brought in people, you know, the economists and we did all this work, but we also, and this is largely the work of faculty at MICA, set up, this is how Indigo operated in the slave trade, the, the cross-Atlantic slave trade. But also, you know, because of their work and some subsequent work that I've done, Indigo was, we call it true blue. It was the only way to get true blue, royal blue. If there's a Black woman at the National Gallery of in London who's gone through their collection and documented when the artist is using indigo paint. And it is the Virgin Mary. Wow. It is the king. It's oh, the king. Sure. And, and it's important to recognize that indigo is sacred everywhere it's grown. It's not just a crop. It starts in India, okay. hence the name. Uh, you know, then in Asia, course. West Africa, South America, because what we call South Carolina indigo is really Guatemalan okay. indigo. You know, how we steal stuff. Slavery in the Caribbean and South Carolina, Georgia, for the most part. Slavery does not become legal in Georgia until they decide to grow indigo. That's how tightly tied it is. Wow. And this is important because what we're doing, indigo seed is, I mean, you can't walk into like your garden store and buy indigo seed. What we are doing is, and it's not just Black farmers, but we're really reaching out to Black farmers to give them seed. Yeah which is difficult, not impossible to get, but not easy to get. And so now we've expanded from urban farmers in Baltimore to with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is a HBCU, a land grant HBCU. Oh, okay. They're the big land grants that you know, you know the big yep. state schools like University of Maryland. 
And then they're called 1890s because the Morrill Act was, I think, 1865. They circled back later and reached out to what would have been colored oh, colleges I didn't know at that. the time. So okay. they are dotted around the country, okay. these land grant HBCUs. And they helped us recruit Black farmers on the Maryland Eastern Shore through this project now has moved from MICA to the Upton Planning Committee in Baltimore, which is a 501c3. Okay. The head of that, Wanda Best, is from South Carolina. So we've engaged Black farmers in South Carolina, some of whom are growing, and this is when people cry, some of whom are growing on the same land that slaves farmed. Yeah, I, I, I was, wow. I, when I read about you and this initiative, I, I immediately, I, so I um, live, I'm outside of Atlanta and Georgia and I'm on the board of Georgia Organics, but also sit within, where the neighborhood yeah. I live in sits within 40 thousand acres of potential agriculture, was agricultural land of various levels, but it's undeveloped really. And so one of the big initiatives with a lot of the foundations and the Trust for Public Land and Conservation Fund is creating a farmer's fund specifically for Chattahoochee Hills to grow crops. And Rodale, the Southeast, has a Southeastern Research Center here. Anyway, long story short, I'm like, sitting here salivating because I'm like, how do we bring, like, you know, can we grow indigo here? How do we bring this initiative here? Because it's such a cool concept, especially if it's well, under-resourced. Let, yes. But anyway, so that's a separate conversation. Oh, oh, and certainly let's talk because we have a farm manager whose job it is to train other okay. farmers. Uh. But and then, you know, the other part of the market is then, so I, let me finish the part. So now we have farmers in Maryland, South Carolina, And this summer, Georgia and South Carolina, North Carolina. And what's important is that and that area, that mid-Atlantic, southeastern area, is where the vast majority of black farmers who are left. But the other problem that farmers have is who do they sell it to? You have to have a market. So basically, there's only one other company in Tennessee that grows indigo. And so there are only two people in the country, us and her, that if you're trying to sell large quantities of indigo that you can sell it to. So what we do is we provide the seeds, we show you how to grow it, and then we come back and buy it. Ah. And the other aspect that small farmers have trouble with is shipping. Yeah. We take care of that as well. Oh my God, that's amazing. Well, you just do the thing that you know how to do. Yes. And we, at first, you know, because I had these highfalutin ideas about a collective and how do we want to do it and looked into, and they said, no, we just want to sell it to you. <laughs> we're farmers. Okay. We grow it's things. Great. We want to sell it to you. And so that's what we're doing. But then when we get it, we hire returning citizens to hang it. And this is the part where we have venture capitalist advisors. They're not investing because that's not sure. the point. And they want us to bake it. But the worker said, it's richer when we hang it. And I said, so what do you mean by richer? And they said, well, our hands get bluer. It smells richer. And the whole point of, and what's lovely is that the other woman who does it just signed a contract with Levi. And we're fine with that, you know, grow the market. Because we're going for like the Whole Foods person. Sure. Who is interested in the slavery story and the idea of returning it back. So the, our story is part yes. of it. And so we're, you know, there's enough room in this of market yeah. for both of us. And so it's not, you know, in fact, we have to be careful not to collude mm-hmm, with each other. Mm-hmm. That would be price yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so what I'm working on now, and also this project owns its own land, because it, if you know what you're doing, you can grow it on brownfields. So there's reclamation of really? brownfields that's going on. And we're trying really hard to do what we can. And when you make dye, you have to alkalinize it. And most people add chemicals, Mm -hmm. but in the colonies, so this is a part of me being an academic, right? In the colonies, they ground up clamshells. Oh, yes. Yeah. And so we're playing around with that to see if we can get the alkaline level high enough naturally. So there's absolutely no carbon. Amazing. Yeah, we saved the stems. The workers showed us that when you hang it, the stems take longer to dry than the leaves. So at some point we strip it from the stems, but we save them and are trying to, you know, we save the stems. And this is a really good thing for the farmers. Farmers have trouble when, even if they have somebody to market, say you're growing cantaloupes, you got to sell, you got what, like a five day window. Sure. 
we can store indigo for at least a wow, year. Okay. You know that. Wow. So one, we can make window. sure that we don't crowd the market, but the farmer doesn't have to worry about, I mean, it, it doesn't like, it's a tropical crop. It does not like frost. It does not like cold. But it starts to drop the leaves and the quality drops immediately. So getting it cut is really important. But after it's dried, as long as it's not in where the humidity will hit it. Sure. And yeah, we have temperature controls. Yeah. And then, okay. So what we're growing now in terms of funding and things like that is growing an ecosystem of people, of artists and makers who will use the I love dye. that. Because it's hard, it's hard to get. So we run some workshops for free because we have funding. Yeah. But we also ask them, how much do you think this is worth? So there's some people who will pay and some people who've already gotten workshops for free. And the other thing that we do is, and I should say the partner there is Neighborhood Fiber Company, which is a Black woman-owned natural dye yarn company wow. who's so cool. actually internationally known, but based in Baltimore. The Pink Hats, after the first yeah. collection. Yes. Yep. She was ground central for the pink really? hats. Really? So that's how well known she so is, cool. but she's our partner. So so we've bought a building, but that's being rehabbed. In the meantime, the workshops are coming out in her workshop, and there's some other projects that we're, we're partnering on. I love it. So we're trying to be ecologically responsible. We're working on different economic models so that the wealth stays in the community. There, there are different kinds of shares that people can earn this is still in the planning stage, can earn via their labor. And there are really fancy ways of doing that or as simple as profit sharing. So all of that's going on and building a website, which is why you didn't find a whole lot because we're, we're building the website, but also building a market for retail. Yeah, it's incredible. Sure. You're talking to a developer now about a brick and mortar retail, but most of it will be yeah. online and working with designers. And, and so we're trying to create a social enterprise ecosystem. And we're focusing on Indigo because it's the most lucrative and also the one that has the most meaning. That's exactly, Um, yeah. Think about Black people in labor. Black people have been alienated from their labor since they got here, since we got here and descended of slaves. They're not from this. When I say people cry, I mean, the farmers are invested in the story. The community is invested in the story. They love it. The community around where we are is delighted. And so there's really no downside to the whole indigo story. Now, when money is involved, always things get, you know, I know. Mm, you know, but, but it's not it's not indigo's fault, it's yeah. the money's fault. So that's what we're doing. But notice aesthetics is woven through the whole thing. I mean, one of the ways that Upton, when they talk to the community, because you know, we're growing in the community, is that it's pretty. Because the way you right. do it is that you do two croppings the way you crop a houseplant. And then the last time you let it go to seed, which means you let it bloom. And it's kind of a magenta flower. And then you go to seed. So the flowers are beauty. But then the indigo is pretty. So we do one last thing I'll tell you about. Because we've had funding. There's a thing in Baltimore called A-Rabbers. They're actually African-Americans. There's a long story about why they're called A-Rabbers. <laughs> but they're street vendors on a horse drawn car. <laughs> Oh. which means they can get into the neighborhood very easily. Yeah. And so we have engaged an A-rabber whose horses are healthy and well-maintained because sometimes that's, you know, course, sure. criticism. James Chase's horses are, and, and I, you know, my daughter's in question, so this is you something care I about, care yeah. about. His horses are well-maintained and healthy. And we go into the community and loaded onto the cart is our vats of indigo dye. <sighs> Wow. And Khabibi Ajanku, who's our indigo fiber artist, does workshops. And we pass out. She tells you a little bit of the cultural history. And then we hand out 100% cotton T-shirts. And she teaches them how to do the traditional African dyes. And we have gloves. But often people will take off the gloves because they want their hands to end up blue. So basically... The die carts then become a way for people who are interested in more to be introduced. And hopefully that will help build us this group of new dyers and makers. There are plenty of artists and dyers and makers who are interested because this is the only way they can get their hands on it. But the whole idea is to work. And we have to, there's another project that I'm talking to a funder about, about crochet and these two projects. Oh, very cool. Can I ask one thing? Because I'm so curious. This is so fascinating and so 
cool. But how how does it make the folk when you approach these farmers? How does it make them feel like when you speak with them and you're mentioning all this and you're talking about the history and the lineage and the changes that can be made? Like what resonates? Like how do they? I'm curious to see like what the farmers must feel like when you speak to them about this opportunity. Well, we had a groundbreaking because the building that that we purchased is an old colored school built in 1858, Harriet Beecher Stowe School, and we were rehabbing it for multiple purposes. But that's where the grinding machines, the bigger grinding machines that we already have funding for will be, but also, you know, classrooms and things like that. And so we had an event last summer and everybody was there, like the politicians were there, but the community was there and two farmers were there from South and North Carolina. Okay. And they spoke and they talked about how deeply meaningful it was to grow a crop that the ancestors grew, to return wealth that ancestors were enslaved mm-hmm. and so didn't benefit from. Because it's important to point out, and I, and I know I'm, I'm the professor who's talking to yeah, long, no. but the indigo market collapsed and didn't come back. So at being like the top two export before the Revolutionary War, mostly to England. So the Revolutionary War uh. disrupted it. And by the time the war was over, cotton, which was much easier to sure. you know, store, to grow, whatever. And soon after that, the synthetic market was oh. developed. And so it wasn't that those people who knew how to grow indigo, for the most part, they just turn around and start growing indigo because the market wasn't there anymore. And so to be part of the reintroduction sure. of indigo to Black farming is something that they take extremely seriously. And at the same time, they're farmers who are trying to survive. And so the fact that we are the market, that we'll turn it with it, we'll provide you the seed and then turn around and buy the product is, you know, because they wouldn't do it if it didn't also make economic well, sense. Well, and, and that's the thing that I've learned is that the farmers need to be farmers. And a huge part of it is the shipping and transport of whatever product that they've created and then the marketplace. So to your point, even if there's a marketplace, How do I get it there? Because maybe I don't have the appropriate facilities to do it or store it or anything. We're going to have to have a part two because there's so much more I want to talk to you about. I know know Monica would do the same thing. So we thank you so much for your time. Do we we miss anything? Do we leave anything out that you'd want to touch on that we haven't yet? I mean, obviously, we want to send everybody to the website and your information. Yes, of course. And I think one of the things, too, our friend Ajahn had me as one of the keynote speakers for his International Association of Applied Aesthetics. And when he didn't tell me what to do, but I turned out later that I did okay, what good. he wanted me to do. <laughs> so these are most neuroscientists yeah. from mostly U- U.S. and Europe. And I mentioned earlier that I was a systems theory. So what I did was to link their, and my PhD is actually in the social sciences, so I could link their work to my work and show how the systems interact. And that's really important in my approach in that, and you said everything is everything, and I am definitely guilty of that, but I'm really happy when I can create this. And in this case, it was seamless in their heads, right? Sure. To take deep neuroscience, and that's why the relationship with Ajahn is so important to me, and work in the on the street and in the field and show how these things and these systems interact so well. And what I love is that at least 10 people change their presentations. Wow. After my talk. Wow. That's impact. That's powerful. Yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. And that's, as you know, the Shakespeare story tells you, I have to have that. I have to have that. Mm -hmm. That feeds me back. Well, and I think we, everything that you're doing is one more way to tell a story of how systems work together. Even if people don't realize they're getting that tale, we're all part of an ecosystem. So they feel it. And, you know, and if we do come back, I would like to talk about KBZ. So we're working with former, they're street kids, Uh, but they, you know, they're squeegee workers. Yes. And they just, they just started, we've been working with them since they were 14 or 15 and now they're 18, 19. And they just formed their own LLC. Wow. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Amazing. At 18, 19. That's incredible. Yeah. They sell only by the case their own branded water. Oh. And this logo was done by a national award winning graphic artist. So, I mean, aesthetics comes through it. Sure. We use a staff member, 
I hired because I said I need somebody who's younger and cooler <laughs> than me. And and he used hip hop yeah. a lot to you know because you know helping them. They said we are businessmen. They're all guys, and so now they have their own LLC. They are applying for minority business enterprise with the city. Somebody is about to help give them a vending machine in the airport. And I said, you can go on your own. And they said, no, you've been here all See? along. Oh, Sherry, this is what I think like you look at the lens of beauty. Like that's so beautiful. And that is what encompasses beauty to me is what your work is all about from top to bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, beauty is a human right. It, it truly is. It truly is. Yeah. With that being said, no, no, no. Again, <laughs> that was a be- that was a beautiful sentiment that you just shared, and you're absolutely right. And we're so thankful that you took the time today to be with us. And we'll share everything I'm in so our show excited. notes of how to follow you mm-hmm. and support you and your work. Yeah. And we can't wait for part two. So thank you for being with us again. Great, thank you. Okay, Monica, I knew that conversation was going to turn out great, and it really did. And I'm so thankful that we got to sit down and talk to her. So. My first question to you is what would be like your key takeaway from that conversation with her? Well, first of all, all of her background seems Mm. to have led her to the sort of natural diet initiative. And I know you're going to hear me blabbing on about this probably for like days, but I I just think an episode that, that we've done really hasn't brought together agriculture, nature, history, culture, all converging, which is really fascinating to me. You know, I'm totally into agriculture. I love art. So I want to figure out how we can bring her to Serenby um, <laughs> of course and do you something do. with us. I know, I know, I know, I know. But what I was your was, big thing? Well, I think what was really interesting to me was when people realized the indigo and how it was grown and how it was used. I think what was so awe-inspiring to me was this aha moment that everyone else had was, oh my gosh. And in her conversation, bringing this to farmers and they having this opportunity to kind of bring back the story of black farmers for indigo itself and the history Mm -hmm. there. And then to be able to create conversations around that and then be, you know, a part of the community to bring something really beautiful to light, which was really incredible to me. Well, and I know I mentioned in an interview, but I think it's worth repeating is that they are providing solutions for the shipping Mm -hmm. and transport as well, the marketplace for the indigo. And that is a huge deal in agriculture. You know, the farmers are farming and they have this incredible crop, but a lot of times they just don't know how to get it to market. Mm -hmm. Um, And then once it's there, they don't know how to market it. So the fact that they're sort of putting all those pieces together, it's a puzzle that is going to be so beneficial for the farmers. And again, I'm curious how we can sort of continue to bring it south down from Maryland. Absolutely. So I think we have such great resources in our show notes that people can really dive into and look at and read more about her work and her initiatives. And I think it was such a great conversation. I know we kept saying we're going to have to have you back. So maybe next year we can have her back on again, because that was just the tip of the iceberg. And now if you want more of her, definitely dig into that video of how beauty works. That was the Mm. panel featuring Sherry and Anjan. All right. So Jen, I guess I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Exactly. See you in a couple of weeks. Have a good one. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the biophilic movement.